Now, when you're cutting out the rings, you'll notice that there are three colored rings in the center, two red, one yellow. There's a silver ring on the side. We don't want the silver ring, just the three center rings. And with the pen tool, and I find when you're using the pen tool and there's like little kind of V-notch kind of things like this, easiest if you start in one of those. You could start on an edge if you want, but I'm just gonna start here and take a look on the screen for a second. Let me just talk about the idea of a tangent, which sounds like a piece of fruit, but it's not. So I'm gonna grab the pen tool, or P on the keyboard, and I'll do a little click right in this little notch down here. Boink, there's my starting point, and you'll notice that my path has begun. I'm gonna move down to here. I'll do a click, which of course connects it with a straight line. I've still got my mouse button held down, and a drag. Now notice I'm dragging to create a tangent. A tangent is a line that butts up against the surface of a curve. And you'll notice that the two handles are about the same distance from the edge here. So this is a tangent. Here's what can go wrong if we create something that isn't a tangent. I often see people, they'll grab this and then they'll go like this, and they're like, oh, look, it's curving down into the, the ring here, which makes sense. First off, you'll notice that my cursor is on the right. I'm moving this handle over here, but look on the left, the inner handle is also moving around. And if the handle end, that little white dot, is inside the ring, remember, think of this as a cannon firing a cannonball towards the center here. If this is inside, I'm firing my cannonball down into the earth. And then gravity pulls it back towards this point here. If I can swing it up higher, if I can change its angle so it fires upwards, now it's firing above the earth, although, it does quickly fall into the earth itself and cut through, that would be bad. Remember I said to think of this as a cannon firing a cannonball towards here. If this handle was extended, it would be like putting more gunpowder in this cannon. And watch this, if I pull this handle a bit longer, if I take it too long, okay, then we've got way too much gunpowder, it fires it really high before it falls back down onto the earth here. But if I shorten it up, if I shorten the handle, change the angle, there we go. And that's really what the whole vector thing is all about. It's not just the direction that this handle is pulling it, it's the magnitude, the, the velocity that you're firing that cannonball out with. So by getting the right direction and the right amount of gunpowder, you can get it to just skim right along the surface of that ring there. And again, don't be squeamish about breaking arms because when we get up to here, you'll notice, uh-oh, even if I get a perfect tangent along the outside here, it does this squiggly down into the ring because this handle is firing it straight down. In this case, option, gets me that little convert point tool, and I can pull it out. If you hold down the command key, you get that direct select tool, and you can then move a point around, you can move handles around, Now, if you rename the path while you're making it, like you notice I just renamed my path, and oh look, I got my snowflake icon again. Um, if I zoom in, find my last point, hover over it, I'll see that little chain link icon, and when I click, boink, it reestablishes that connection. And remember you want all of the subsequent paths on the inside to appear on the same path over here. So once you've closed it off, when you hover over that first point, you'll see that little circle icon. When you click, you'll get your little snowflake icon back. When you go to the inside there, make sure this layer is still selected, this path layer. And that'll put those subsequent subpaths on the same path layer. Once you've got the rings outlined, and you might notice on mine, oops, I have the, uh, <clears throat> the center parts are white instead of gray. If I zoom in there, you can see that, huh, got a little bit of a problem going on here. Uh, again, I can select each of these inner paths individually. If I grab my pen tool, hold down the command key, I can select this path here. And I know this one's selected because I can see the points and handles. On the other paths, I just see the lines. And from this little pop-up here, I can choose subtract 
front shape. And you can see the center there goes gray. I can move on to the next one, click on it, click on this. It al it's already checked to subtract front shape because that's what my pen tool is ready to make. But if I click on it again, subtract front shape, it specifies subtract front shape for that path there. And same thing for this one here. Click on the pop-up, it's already checked, but if I recheck it, boink, it removes that from the selection as well. And once you've got that done, once you see gray on the outside, gray on the inside of the rings and white rings themselves, you'll notice when you have the pen tool selected at the top, there's a button in your options bar called mask. And if you click on that, it will make a vector mask. Give that a try. So make sure you got your pen tool selected, P on the keyboard if you have to. And then at the top, you'll see the little button, mask, click on it, and you should see that background disappear. Just like when we put on a layer mask, except it's not a layer mask. And you might think, oh look, it made another path. And in fact, there are two layers in my paths panel, but this is not a path. This is the vector mask. Just like in your channels panel, you can see your color channels. In the paths panel, you can see a vector mask. And you notice it says layer zero vector mask. And you're like, well, what's layer zero? Let me pop back into my layers for a second. That's layer zero. When you first open a document, the main layer is called background. It's a background layer and it's locked. But as soon as I gave it the vector mask, it unlocked the layer. It named it layer zero. And look, layer zero has a vector mask. Layer zero vector mask. Now here's the cool thing about vector masks. With the layer mask, we were able to do like soft edges. You know, we could paint with white paint on it. We brought back that soft edge on the reflection. With a vector mask, you're not gonna be able to do soft edges. It's gonna be a nice hard edge the whole way around, which for these rings is fine. It's, it's hard all the way around. But let's say you'd messed something up. Like, oh, oh, I forgot to break an arm over here. So those handles are going this way. It fired my cannonball up this way and back down. If I'd used a layer mask on that, I'd have to go in with a paintbrush and I'd have to you know, paint it all back in with white. But on a vector mask, watch this. Hold down the command key, select that path. Ah, you can edit a vector mask after the fact. So if I hold down the option key, there's my convert point tool. I can snap, break its arm, and it updates in real time. So I can see how much of a curve I need to bend in here. Maybe I can shorten that arm a little bit. Maybe shorten this arm a little bit. And you can play around with it until everything is where it's supposed to be. So they're always editable and it will update what's being revealed and what's being hidden at any time. So play around with that, throw it onto a white background exactly the same as the wine glass, and give it a drop shadow. Where do we get drop shadows from again? The little FX thing in the corner. They're called layer styles, not layer effects, but there you go. We'll click on the layer styles pop up. We'll go to drop shadow. And depending on what you used last, oh, wait a minute, ha, huh, why do I not see my drop shadow here? Hey, look, I can move it around. I don't see anything. Why might that be? Let's take a look at what I had selected. <laughs> yeah, I had my background layer selected. So it was getting a drop shadow, it was just outside the canvas. Uh, make sure you select the rings layer before you go down to the FX. Throw on a drop shadow and try to find something that at least kind of matches the lighting on those rings. Like looking at the reflections in the rings, I'm thinking it's either a soft box or maybe some foam cards that are being lit up. So it's probably a fairly soft light. So a small size probably wouldn't be all that convincing. As you bring that size up, it gets to be a softer edge. It's almost like playing with the size of the light source. A pinpoint light source would get a very hard edged shadow. A larger light source would get a much softer shadow. And you can play around with the opacity. I see there's cards all the way around it in the reflection, so it's probably a fairly soft shadow. If you want to play around with the distance and the angle, the angle is the, you know, the angle that the light is shining on it from. If you just click on the image itself, you can actually drag this around and you can see the angle dial and the distance slider updating itself as you move that around. Now, once you put that drop shadow under, it may reveal some previously undisclosed inaccuracies. When it was just on a white background, if we were off a little bit with our path there, you can see it's a little bit on the outside, probably not that big of a deal, but once that drop shadow appears, it might become quite noticeable. Again, you can edit this vector mask at any time. If you click on it, grab your pen tool, option click, 
to select the points and you can nudge them around just to close up those little gaps. Oh, guys, let me just show you a, a little trick that um, I showed someone else earlier. Uh, for you guys, if you double click a JPEG, it probably opens up in that preview program. If you want JPEGs to always open in Photoshop, and I've got any image file, PNG, JPEG, you name it, TIFFs, it all opens up in Photoshop. If you want all your JPEGs to open in Photoshop, select any old JPEG file, get info on it, either file, get info, or the keyboard shortcut is Command I. And down near the bottom, in the middle there, where it says Open With, choose Photoshop, whichever version of Photoshop you want it to open with, if you have multiple versions of ins installed. And that will make that specific JPEG open in Photoshop if you double click it. If you want all JPEGs to open in Photoshop, click the Change All button. And it'll ask, are you sure you want to change all similar documents, so all JPEGs, to open with the application Photoshop? Hit Continue, and any JPEG you double click will open up in Photoshop.